grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. From God, our Heavenly Father, and from the Savior who overcame Satan and his, all the fallen angels to give us victory. Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. The text for us to ponder on this Reformation Sunday comes from the Gospel of Luke, a brief portion of chapter 8. The words of Jesus. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. This is the word of God. Today I'd like to begin by telling you about someone who is truly faithful in attending worship services and group Bible study classes. You could definitely say about him, every time the doors of the church are opened up, he's there. I once uh, talked about a lady who had uh, perfect church and Sunday school attendance for 80 straight years. But quite honestly, this person puts that lady to shame. For he has had perfect attendance at worship services and Sunday school classes for literally hundreds of years. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Satan, the evil one, the great deceiver. Satan has had perfect attendance at worship services and group Bible study classes for some 2,000 years now. Every time God's people gather to hear God's word, you can be certain that Satan or one of his demons is there. Satan is there doing everything he possibly can to keep us from hearing the word of God and to keep us from believing the word of God. As we just heard from our text for today, Satan wants to take the word right out of our hearts. In fact, he is here today to try and take the word of God out of our hearts just as he has been up here on this hill for 222 years, trying to keep us from listening to God's word or believing God's word. Why does he want to do this? Why does Satan want to keep us from God's word? Because Satan knows that the word of God is the power of God unto salvation. Satan knows that the Holy Spirit works in every word of God in the scriptures to bring people to faith, and to build people up in their faith. He knows the power and value of God's word. And so he desperately wants to keep us from God's word so that perhaps our souls can be his. Yes, Satan is the one who is here each time God's word is to be opened up. He comes to interfere with our ability to hear and believe. And he's been doing this for a long, long time. I mean, just look back to the church in the days of Martin Luther. If you consider the condition of the church back then, you can see how Satan was at work. First of all, the Bible was only available in Latin, and most of the people of Germany could not read Latin. People could not read the Bible on their own then, and quite honestly, there was no big push to get the Bible translated into the German language. Most of the church leaders really didn't want people to be able to read the Bible on their own. They wanted people to have to take their word about what was said in God's word. And most of the worship services were done entirely in Latin too. And again, this kept most people from understanding anything that was being said. Satan most certainly was keeping the word from people's hearts. But Satan did even more too. For he tried to make sure that no one believed in Jesus as the Savior and as the way to eternal life in heaven. For he led false teachers to proclaim different ways into heaven. For example, he led the leaders of the church to proclaim that if you bought an indulgence, you would automatically receive forgiveness of all your sins. And you could be assured that when you died, you'd go straight to heaven. And the people of that day loved that teaching. Why, they could go ahead and sin all they wanted to. They could go ahead and indulge themselves as much as they wanted. As long as they bought that indulgence, then they would get into heaven. That's what they thought. 
And you can just smell the stench of the evil one on this putrid teaching. But boy, was it popular. People didn't need to look to Christ. They didn't have to avoid sin. They just had to pay the money to get an indulgence. And because of this awful lie, people would not even listen when someone would come around proclaiming Jesus Christ to them. Because they didn't need him. I mean, they had an indulgence. So you can see how clearly Satan was working to keep people from hearing the word and believing it. And that's just what he's been doing today, too. I mean, where do people today get the idea that it's not really important to take part in a worship service each week? Well, I'll tell you where. It comes straight from Satan. You know, even before COVID-19, when we had a Sunday with pretty good worship attendance, we would still have less than 40% of our church members here on that Sunday. And we could have even less in our Sunday school and adult Bible study classes. Why is that? And why is it that 80% of church-going people don't read their Bible on a daily basis? Well, I'll tell you why. Satan is up to his old dirty tricks trying to keep people away from the word. Now, obviously, he doesn't come up and say, hi, I'm Satan, and I got a favor to ask of you. Just stay away from church and stay away from your Bible. He doesn't come up like that. No, he's sneakier than that. He just tries to convince Christians that they don't really need to go to church each Sunday. And he shows you all the other things that you could be doing rather than going to church or to worship or take part in a group Bible study class. He tries to convince you that it's okay to just sleep in on Sundays because you need that little extra sleep. Or it's okay to go out fishing or golfing or to take that drive with your family to see the fall colors. He'll give you excuse after excuse after excuse to keep you from coming and personally hearing the word of God. And boy, do we fall for those excuses. So for most Christians today, going to church, group Bible study classes, reading the Bible, they've all become optional. We can do it if we want to, but we don't need to. They're not really all that important. That's what we honestly seem to think. Satan is good at keeping us from God's word. And even when we do come and hear God's word, Satan is highly effective at distracting us so that we don't really hear it at all. I mean, how many times has it happened to you that instead of thinking about God and listening to his word, the whole time you're in church, you're thinking of other things, maybe of the chores you need to do, maybe about that football game that's coming up, maybe you're thinking about some of the other people that are in the church here with you. How many times have you sat through a worship service and by Sunday afternoon you can't remember what the readings were or what the sermon was about? Oh, yes, Satan is great at distracting us. And when miracle of miracles, we actually hear the word of God, Satan still has one more trick up his sleeve. For he gets us to not really believe it or live it. For example, maybe we hear God's call to personally get involved in evangelism, in reaching the lost. As we sit in church, we realize that God actually wants to use us to talk about our faith to unbelievers and to invite people to come to church with us each week. We realize all that while we're sitting in the pew in church. But by the time we leave church, well, we put God's call to make disciples completely out of our minds. And we never actually do anything to reach the lost at all. Or maybe while we're in church, the Holy Spirit reveals to us a sin in our lives a sin that needs to be done away with, a sin that needs to be removed from our lives. So at first, we're, we're feeling the pain of guilt. But then after a little bit, all the excuses start coming forward. Why, there are plenty of other Christians doing the same thing. I'm no worse than they are. And the pastor is just wrong about that. I mean, the, his views are so outdated. Not really wrong, not anymore. At least not under my circumstances. And by the time we get done coming up with our excuses, well, we never actually do repent of that sin or change our lives. Or maybe we hear the promise of God in church one morning that he's always going to love us and take care of us and provide for us. But by the end of the day, all that's forgotten. 
And we go right back to worrying about how we're going to be able to pay all our bills. Tell me, how many times have you heard the word of God in church or in Bible study, but either outright ignored it or came up with excuses for why you didn't really need to obey it? How many times has that happened to you? How many times have you heard the word of God, but then blocked it out of your mind completely? How many times have you failed to act on what you clearly heard God's word say? Oh, Satan is good at keeping us from hearing and believing and living God's word. And he's even good at keeping us convinced that we don't really need the Savior either. And that's Satan's ultimate goal. I'll tell you what, so many people today believe in a, a form of universalism that it doesn't really matter what you believe. Everybody's going to go to heaven anyway. And so many of others of us have fallen into that trap of Satan called works righteousness, that God's going to reward us for our good behavior and thus give us eternal life in heaven with him. Many people today seem to be looking to their own lives and their own good works as the reason why they'll get into heaven instead of looking to Christ and the works that he did for us on the cross. Oh, yes, Satan is good at what he does. And he has been powerful and effective among us too. And that brings us to our main point on this Reformation Sunday. The church of today needs reforming just as much as the church in Luther's day. I mean, Satan has corrupted the church today just as much as he corrupted the church back then. Now, that may be painful for us to admit. It's, it's hard to admit that our lives need reforming. It's, it's hard to admit that our churches need reforming. But it's the truth. The church today needs a reformation just as the church did in Luther's day. But how can we start a reformation today? How can we begin to truly change the way things are, are, are done in the church so that it can be closer to what God intended all along? How can we overcome the work of the evil one so that our lives in church can truly bring glory to the name of God? Well, the way we change the church today is the same way the church was changed back in Luther's day, by emphasizing two main things. First of all, we must emphasize again and again that salvation can only be found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. For any reformation to take place today, we need to look anew to the cross of Jesus Christ. For no one's going to make it into heaven based on his or her good works. And everyone will not automatically just go to heaven. Only those who believe in Jesus will be saved. Only those who look to him and his death on the cross will be saved. A while back, I read a story in a newspaper about Randy Burris from Athens, Georgia. Randy was out mowing his front yard when Heather Carlson... A neighbor walked by pushing her two-month-old daughter in a stroller. He stopped, turned off the lawnmower, and they chatted for a few moments. When all of a sudden, a, a, a car came screaming around the corner with a drunk driver behind the wheel, and it was headed straight for them. Well, when Burris realized what was happening, he quickly ran up to the woman and her child and pushed them out of the way of that speeding car but he himself was hit by it. Some hours later, Randy Burris died from his injuries. He died to save someone else from certain death. And my friends, that's what Jesus Christ did for us. He died to save us from certain death. You see, because of our sin, we would have indeed been condemned to eternal life in hell. But Jesus Christ loved us, and he came, and he rescued us from eternal death by giving up his life on the cross. He gave up his life for us, for our sins, for your sins and my sins. He died on that cross so that we could live. 
And, and I'll tell you what, powerful things happen when we proclaim Jesus Christ and his cross. Powerful things happen. Souls are saved. Faith is given. Faith is strengthened. Priorities are changed. So many wonderful things happen. So the first thing we must do if we're going to start a new reformation is to truly focus all over again on what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And the second thing we must do is renew our commitment to being in the word, to listen to the word, to believe the word, and to actually live the word too. For it is the power of the word of God that really started the Reformation in Luther's day. See, Luther gave God's word to the people. He translated the Bible into German. He preached in the language of the people. He wrote the small catechism so people could learn the word of God and then teach it to their families and children. Luther stressed the importance of being in the word. And that's when those powerful changes began to happen in the church and throughout society, in fact, throughout Europe. Powerful changes that truly were the work of the Holy Spirit who was finally unleashed and for changes to take place in the church of today, well, we too need to renew our commitment to being in the Word too. We need to make the commitment that, yes, we're going to read the Bible each day. We need to make the commitment that every Sunday we will take part in a worship service and that we will take part in at least one group Bible study class each week. We need to make the commitment. And then we need to discipline ourselves so that, when we are listening to the word, we are actually listening to what God is saying to us then. And we must also discipline ourselves to put that word of God that we hear into practice. Even if it's difficult, even if it demands major changes in our lives, even if it involves sacrifice, we need to keep our focus on Christ and we need to more fully be in the word of God. For then powerful things will happen today too. My friends, for too long we've fallen prey to the traps of the evil one. We've allowed him to keep us out of God's word as we came up with excuse after excuse for skipping out on worship services and Bible study classes and our personal Bible study time. We've allowed him to distract us so that God's word even when it was being taught or proclaimed, never really got into our hearts or minds or souls at all. And we allowed him to trick us into believing that we don't really have to live that word of God that we do here. For too often, we have despised the word of God by how we actually treat it and live it. But now is the time for all that to change. Now is the time for a new reformation to begin. And this new reformation has to start with us. It has to start with you. So don't let Satan keep you away from the word of God. Do be involved in a worship service each week and read your Bible each day and take part in a group Bible study class. Let's unleash the power of God in our midst and see what the Holy Spirit will do today. For I'll tell you what, if all of us do this, if we commit ourselves to the word, well, the changes that will take place today will be just as astounding as they were back in Luther's day. And more and more people will come to know the reality of God and his love because they will see him in us. May it be so among us, my friends. May it be so among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. And now may the Holy Spirit of God open up our eyes so that we can see what Satan has been trying to do in our lives and may he help us to overcome those traps and truly immerse ourselves in Christ and in the powerful word of God. Amen.